Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for just who You are, all You've done in our lives. We just give You all the glory and the honor and the praise. I ask that You would take charge of this time. Filter out that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts the truth of Your Word that we may grow in grace and knowledge of You. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve uh, at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the second epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. We're in chapter 4. I have always believed, uh, pretty much ever since I became a Christian, that theological error precedes moral error. And that carries over into society. Uh, basic uh, principles of morals. Now, we don't live under morals as a Christian. We live under grace. There's a big difference. But we've been looking at, since we began this study in 1 Corinthians, we've been looking at uh, uh, letters written to a church that was God-considered carnal, uh, fleshly, and what we see contrasted with that carnality is the finished work of Christ. It is true that there was a lot of hanky-panky going on there, you know, in Corinth. You know, as, as far as what we would typically today, we would consider bad behavior. But that bad behavior was the result of a lack of faith, a, a lack of interest in, in biblical truth, sound doctrine, or, or just the, the plain ignorance of it. You know, we have to keep in mind that Christianity at that time was, was new. Peter writes that it's by these great and precious promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. And folks, God doesn't need any help. I've, I've actually heard Christians say, well, God, God's depending on me. God is really depending on me. And that's backwards thinking. The, the strange paradox here, folks, with, when, it, when it concerns the Christian life, is that the way up is down. It is when we are weak that we are strong. This power does not come from ourselves, but from God. We seem to have this insidious idea that, well, if we just do everything right the way that we're supposed to do, then that releases God's power. And He's able then to operate, whereas he would not have been if we hadn't. What we are looking at right now in this passage, that we're not sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as, as being of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That is the normal Christian life. It's not some exceptional life of Paul and Barnabas and Timothy or whoever who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, that's law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter kills. You have death associated with the law. And death is never a pleasant subject. The, ch the church, churches, plural, at Corinth. I'm sure there was more than one. God considers them, He considered them carnal and fleshly. Why were they carnal and fleshly? Why were they involved in activity that we not many of us wouldn't even wouldn't think about being involved in? It has to be because theological error precedes moral error. 
And you can turn that around and you can say theological truth precedes godly living. We've been given a ministry of liberty. He's talking to, this is a love letter from God to you, okay? And he's addressing your carnality. He's not just addressing the carnality of some church back nearly 2,000 years ago. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good and righteous and holy. It's the law keeping. It's the attempt to try to keep the law. And, and the law was not made for a righteous man, and that is what you are. This is what the Corinthians needed to know. They needed to understand this. They needed to, un to understand just who Jesus was and, and what he really did on their behalf and what was accomplished by Christ for them whereby an effectual change occurred in their life. And they were no longer carnal, but they were acting spiritually. We have this treasure in broken, fragile, burnt vessels. That's what you see in the Greek. So that the power of God would be not, not of ourselves. But we, we try the best we can to make it of us. And when we go down that path, which the majority of Christians have, it has been a, it has been a result of someone preaching the Word of God deceitfully, watering it down, diluting it, perverting it, subverting it. corrupting it, adulterating it, and it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much water in that wine to turn it into something other than what it was intended to be. Whether it's we, we preach uh, by uh, omission, by, by not, not telling you what's true, or telling you something that just flat out isn't true. There are no, and this is just my opinion, there are no, no human words, there's no words in our vocabulary to, to adequately describe what's going on in the Christian's life better than the very words that we're reading. You know, I can, I can expound on it. I, I can say, well, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and, and not of ourselves. Okay, all right, so we're not under law. We're under grace. We don't affect any change either internally, externally. We don't do that. That's the Holy Spirit. He guides us into truth. He seals heart, uh, truth to our hearts. He makes that truth effectual in our lives. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair we're persecuted but not forsaken we're struck down but we're not destroyed always caring about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life of jesus also may be manifested in our body for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh so then death is working in us but life in you, and I just described to you the normal Christian life. Not some exceptional life of Paul, or Barnabas, or Timothy, or the church at Corinth. This is the Christian life, but you wouldn't know that looking around today. Look at this hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. What, Steve, what he's talking about here is this is the opposition that Paul encountered with the non believing pagan world, non Christian world. Because sure, surely Christians wouldn't do this to each other. To each other, I mean, that what we're looking at is the the opposition 
between the finished work of Christ and a world religious system, a theological system, an ecclesiastical system based on human merit, which all, by the way, all other religions are. Christianity is the only, only what you would call religion, and I use that term loosely because it's not a religion, but it, it is the only religion that is not based on human merit. All the rest of them are, without exception, Christianity is unique in the sense that it's not. In our affliction, our persecution, our suffering, our trouble, our sorrow, our close encounters, our sticky messes that we get into with other Christians, our debates, who would give their lives, I'm sure they would, they would, they would give their lives as a testimony to what they believe. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We got to stop and think about that verse. He only died once. He's not going to die again. There's constant pressure. We are hard pressed on every side. The hard pressed on every side, the crushed and perplexed and persecuted and struck down. I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Well, obviously, that's not something that if I was, if I had a bunch of sheep, I wouldn't send them out among the wolves. I mean, it's just stupid. I mean, you know, who would do that? Our fight is not with wolves. Imagine that he sent us out as sheep among wolves, but the wolves, we, the, we, the sheep, are victorious. If, if I had sheep and I sent them out among wolves, they'd get, they'd get eaten up, okay? I, I'm, they'd get eaten up. They'd get decimated. But God sends us out as sheep among wolves and we're victorious. Why is that? How can he send us out as sheep among wolves and us be so victorious? The pressure there is, if you keep it in context, the, the pressure that we're under is to dilute the Word of God, to water it down, to not present it faithfully. That, that's the pressure. It's pressure from a the ecclesiastical system, the legal system, the world system, the, the world religious system based on human merit. If you read down through these verses with the idea in your mind, which I believe we, we should, God is contrasting carnality, which is basically stems from law keeping as a rule of life. There's walking in the spirit, there's walking in the flesh. That's law. Folks, we're not selling a product. It was, it was that religious system that was in opposition to Paul and what he was teaching, and why not? I mean, look at, look at the situation. You know, you've got a whole entire nation, Israel, that God gave them the law, they couldn't keep it. You know, Paul was trained up, uh, raised up as, you know, as a, uh, basically a legal scholar, a theological uh, master. You know, I mean, he probably could have quoted the first five books of the, of the Old Testament forwards and backwards. I mean, the guy was smart. He was dedicated. He was loyal. He understood the Scriptures. But when we get over to Philippians, we see he counted it all as rubbish, as, as garbage, basically. All of that. To know Christ in a way that, that he, he, he admitted that he had never really fully come to experience before that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Oh, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. He's alive. It's not we're operating separately. God's He raised from the dead and we're off over here. We're, we're under law. We put ourselves under law. We're putting others under law. We're operating independently of the God who raised from the dead, who, who lives in us, and desires more than anything well let me just let me put let me phrase it this way i am sure that each and every one of you would adore seeing christ in me i don't think you'd much want to just see me i mean you know 
There's a huge difference. There's a vast gulf that exists between my life, my will, my strength, my power, my emotions, my, my everything, my decisions, my plans, my schemes, my everything, and the life of Christ. What the New Testament does, the New Covenant under grace does, is it takes us out from underneath all of that. And it places us in a situation that's not very pleasant. Now all of a sudden, that legal system, the ecclesiastical, theological system that God, by the, the Bible, by the way, calls the world, it, in, and you know, I, hate to keep, I hate to keep taking these rabbit trails here, but folks, the word world in the New Testament is primarily a word that's used to describe the, a theological system. That's what the world is. We've died to it. We've died to sin, self, the law, the world, and Satan, and even death. I've, I've done a video, I believe, on all six of these things. Sin. We've died to sin. We've died to self. We've died to the law. We've died to the world. We've died to Satan, and we've died to death. Death has no hold on us. And what I want you to understand is, is that you know, the most, the most insidious enemy that you would ever have to fight is one that, that, that you don't recognize. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. His messengers array themselves as messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to look for what Paul was hard-pressed on, if you want to look and, and identify, if you want to identify and locate what perplexed him, what persecuted him, what struck him down, you don't need to look any further than the pulpit. And it's not just the pulpit today. It's Christianity in the main today, which is preaching primarily that you've got to do something to earn God's favor. To earn heaven. To earn His blessings. That He doesn't bless you apart from your... Ob oh, Steve, obedience brings blessings. No, no. No, no, no. I, I don't know if you've, you've if you've lived that lie your whole life or not, but obedience does not bring blessings. Obedience is the result of God's blessings. Devotion first and God's blessings second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. I think the United States of America is a dangerous country to live in. One of the danger, most dangerous countries on earth to live in. And I'm not talking about all the violence, the street violence, and all of the riots, and all of the, the burnings of the buildings and police cars, and I'm, you know, all of the, 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 the murders and all of the, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about theologically, the United States of America is probably the most dangerous place on earth to live. Theologically speaking, God blessed this great nation when He set Israel aside in unbelief and, and salvation came to the Gentiles and God raised up this great country and, and He did it on, on Judea. He raised it up on based on Judeo-Christian principles. It was to be a light to the, to the nations. And what, what have we done? We've adulterated the Word of God and we've exported that all around the world. That's what we've done. And in the meantime, while we've done that, we persecuted God's own people. It's, it's really hard, I know. It may be difficult for many of you to grasp the, the, the hard, cold fact of the matter, the reality that Christians today persecute other Christians 
They may not be sticking your head in a guillotine. They may not be shooting your tires out of your pickup, you know, when you drive to church. They might not be throwing rocks at you when you walk into the cathedral or the, or the synagogue or the church or the assembly, wherever you're meeting. No, what they do is wait till you get there. And then they decimate you every way. Well, it's not you that they decimate. It's the Word of God. They don't understand. They don't, they don't study this book. They don't, they don't understand the covenant that we are... Actually, really, truly understand the covenant of grace that we're under. They, they somehow think that we're still under some form of the law. That there's still some room, some space, some place for human merit in our walk, in our relationship, in our communion with God and with one another. And then we treat one another on that same basis. All who live, desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, that's not keeping the law. That is living under grace they shall suffer persecution. If you want to avoid persecution by other Christians, if that's your aim, if that's your mission in life, I don't, Steve, I don't want any conflict. I don't want to upset the apple cart. I don't want to stir up any trouble. I don't want to stir up a hornet's nest. I don't want to be thought of as being mean or unloving. Or... Jesus prayed that He not take us out of the world, that world system. And He didn't. To live in a, in a, in a Christian nation and, and live in a, in a Christian world where, oh my goodness, I mean, everyone is just, just worshiping God on the basis of what He's done, not what they must do for God, but but, but just growing in grace and knowledge of Christ, whoa, wouldn't that be wonderful? No, I suppose it would be, but it was not God's intention. That could be perplexing. Hard-pressed, pressured on every side. The pressure comes from Christians, not the pagan world, not the non-believing world that, that couldn't care less about you whether you went to church one day a week or, or seven days a week. They can care less. But the minute that you go preaching faithfully, this book, there's nothing new under the sun. When we look at, at not like we did in the last video, at the life of Moses, and we look at the life of Paul, and we look at the life of you and me, things didn't change. What I am willing to suggest is that it's no different today than it was in our Lord's day. The opposition that he encountered is the same opposition that we encounter. The same opposition that we encounter is the same opposition Moses encountered with God's people. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. It's not the, the word death here is not referring to the, to the death of his life, his physical life. It's, it was his death that pursued him by the theological system. Death pursued our Savior as He traveled through, moved through that theological system. And it, the same is true of us. The word life is, is zoe. In order that the life, zoe, that's, that means quality of life. That's, that's not, it says life of Jesus also may be manifested in, in our mortal body. That phrase, the life of Jesus, that we're looking at as being manifested in our mortal body, that's not the life of Jesus that died on the cross. Now, I don't want to confuse folks here, but the word life there, when you look at any verse of where the he, Christ came and He laid down His life for His, his people, that word is suke his breath, his soul. It's zoe life, it's the quality of life, it's eternal life, guaranteed eternal life. The soul life, suke means the soul life. That's what died on the cross.
that which had breath, that which had a soul, the human seed of, of, of emotions that died on the cross. That's not the life that's manifest through our mortal flesh. The life that's manifest through our mortal flesh is His divine nature of which we become a partaker of, the eternal life of Jesus Christ. What died on the cross was not, not Zoe, the life. The, the Zoe life didn't die on the cross. The Suke life died on the cross. Marvel not that the world hates, the system hates you, that theological system. That world is, uh, is always, in Scripture, it's always the theological system. We're looking at the normal Christian life. What we're looking at is a context of the, what is the normal Christian life in opposition to a world religious system that hates you, that would put you to death thinking it's doing God a service. And I guess I didn't get too far in this message this week. So I apologize for that, but I do uh, thank you for tuning in. I love you all. I truly do. Uh, rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.